Okay, let's talk about weeds now. We know that weeds can be an issue in organic systems, of course. And we had a bit of a dis yeah, we had a discussion about Canada thistle the other day in one session. And uh, what I'm going to present now is some work. Uh, the weeds team really on this has been Gord Thomas. He's recently retired. Julia Leeson has been keeping it up, and we're going to be cooperating them with what Bill Shad is. So we have a PhD student looking more in depth, and we're going to be trying to figure out why, what's happening with the weed populations, and how they're affecting organic. Um, so let's first look at the prior to spring disturbance weed counts. Actually, let's skip this because I want to get to the, I thought, I actually thought I had way more time than I have. So we're just going to, let's get to the residual weed counts. These are the weed counts that are left after, that are, that are left to go to maturity in the crop. These are the ones that are left after you in crop harrow or a conventional farmer would spray. These are the crops that are, the weeds that are left. And what we indeed do see in this set, uh, in these, in these uh, uh, pictures here, I'm just going to step up here. These are all the organic ones are green in here, so you see the weed densities are higher in the organic system. This is the such as the summer follow based system, the light light green, the annual based system, and then the perennial based system has alfalfa in it. And interestingly enough, what we do see is that the weed populations, the organic, are higher. They actually dip down to a, a fairly low level. The weeds did, you know, that's a common perception by many farmers that aren't organic, is that your weeds, the weeds are going to go crazy, go out of control, and, and that's all you're going to have. And we know that's not true, right? We know that, we, that they can be managed. Yes, there are years that it's going to look like really bad. But, yeah, people are hitting each other going, yeah, it's one of those years. Uh, but they can be taken control. Interestingly enough, what we are seeing here is that the diversify, is that the system with the alfalfa in there actually had the highest level of yields. But there's going to be a contradiction here. I'm kind of, uh, I'm kind of jumping ahead. There's something here that tweaked our interest. So the perennial system is showing higher weed counts after, you know, in crop. And these are the weeds that are producing seeds. Uh, let's go ahead now. Most of these weeds we see here, these are the different weeds. Uh, you can, let's just look at, we've seen a lot of green foxtail out in Scotland. We see a lot of green foxtail in their organic labs, labs quarters, shepherd's purse. And then you get down uh, to lower numbers, you know, as, uh, as was mentioned previously, where's the wild oats? The wild oats are actually worse in the no-till plots, interestingly enough, than the organic plots. Uh, it's not true on every organic farm. I know we've done some work, and uh, you know how many, you know, what we, the most wild oats you can fit in one square meter is about 2,000, is about 500, and you know, and uh, I know this because I've counted them, and I know as my students have counted, that's as many as you can actually fit they can grow, and I, we've seen those in some organic fields, and uh, <laughs> they can be bad, but in Scott, they're, they're not. Uh, but these are the weeds that are dominating. What else do we have? Okay, so we so here's our residual, what I've shown you before. Now I'm going to show you a graph that kind of begs to differ a little bit. And this is the, and this what this one is showing is the weed biomass as a percentage of the crop biomass in those different systems. And this is in the low diversity, the summer follow based system. And what we see, interestingly enough, is in the dry years, we had the weed biomass in the organic. The organic is blue in this case getting up to about 35% of what the crop biomass was. Probably, that'd be probably about equivalent of 35% yield reduction. But we've seen a reduction in, since that time. You know, to the point of, in 2007, for, mo and for much of the time, it was, uh, with the exception of those drought years, it was below 5% of the crop biomass. So there's weed numbers that are there. There's weeds that are there, but they don't seem to be taking up that much biomass. Similarly, in the diversified annual, in the, where we have a diversified rotation, the organic rotation, we are seeing it, it's a bit more, because we don't have as much fallow in there, as much tillage as probably, we're seeing it bump up, but it's getting, most of the time, it's at or around 10%, which is certainly tolerable, right? You know, 10% of your biomass is weeds, it's not a big deal. You can live with that, right? That's, uh, it's really livable. In the diversified annual perennial, again, we saw this blue <coughs> pop in the drought years. And interestingly enough, this kind of trend down. And for 2000, we don't have the 08 and 09, 010 and 10 data in here. And we're probably seeing a rise up again uh, based on some of the 08 numbers I've seen. But, but it's, cer it's certainly, there's something interesting happening here. We have a lot of weeds here. 
but they don't seem to be contributing that much of the that to that that their biomass isn't that much. So this, this got me thinking: what is happening? What the heck is going on here? Um, and uh, and, and part of my, for what Dilshan is going to work on, we came up with this idea that the wheat population dynamics differ between organic and conventional systems. That there's, a, that there's something different that's happening there. And we want to try to find out what is that that's happening and are there things we do to promote those mechanisms more. So, that, you know, it seems that weeds are more common under diverse uh, organic cropping systems, but less problematic. They probably don't grow as well. So why is that happening? Well, we have some hypotheses that we're going to test. Uh, oh, here we got our objectives. Sorry about that. Uh, we, so our, 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 it gets our objectives. How do the wheat population dynamics differ? That's the obvious objective. How does cropping systems rotation affect this? Uh, how do wheat populations affect the biomass crop yield and crop yield loss? We've looked a little bit at this already. And how do these drivers of wheat population uh, system differ between the systems in rotation. You know, we know that we've heard about that, uh, that you know, phosphorus export, to export can be an issue. Well, and while it's not happening in the perennial one much, in the annual one, we, we can see the organic, we are having net phosphorus exports. Is that, you know, we know that some weeds and uh, some weeds don't do as well under lower nutrient conditions. You know, there's this idea that weeds thrive in areas that are poor in terms of fertility. Well, that's not true at all. Our weeds co-evolve with our agricultural system, and they tend to do much better where there's a higher nutrient levels, and, uh, and especially when you have a competitive crop, as was previously said. Our next hypothesis we're going to look at is to look at seed predation, uh, to look at uh, and, and what seems, there seems to be a, some good research coming out. I know Martin did some at Glen Lee a while ago, but there's some good research coming out that there's a lot of things out there that eat weed seeds. Uh, in Iowa, they've, uh, in soybean, they find that about 80 to 90 percent of the weed seeds that fall on the ground and remain exposed or exposed are, are eaten in August, September. In the Czech Republic, they've measured rates of seed consumption of up to a thousand seeds per meter squared per day of bugs eating that much. You know, just munching down. Um, in Western Canada, we know that no-till normally has a positive effect on us. So anytime you bury, of course, if you bury the weed seed, it's harder to find, right? So the idea is you keep it on the end. Um, we don't know how it works in cultivation. And normally these studies are done compared to plowing, which is a complete inversion. So we don't know. So we're going to look at that. Here's just some pictures of some of our some of our friends. You know, everybody always, you know uh, always thinks that mice are bad farming. Well, m well, mice actually eat a lot of weed seeds. Turns out they're you know they're but their populations are variable, maybe cyclical. Birds eat weed seeds too, but they're not that important in terms of how much they eat in if you look at the literature. Invertebrates like carabids, which is in a picture there, and ants, they're not important in arable agriculture because we usually rip up their uh, homes and they don't do well when you tear them up. Uh, and crickets, ants and crickets tend to be our, our, our friends in terms of eating weed seeds. If you look at their, so crabid beetles, uh, if you look at them, they're omnivores. Sometimes they've been classified into uh, ones that eat seeds and ones that don't. But I've talked to essentially the world expert in crabbits, and he says that ain't true. He says they're like us. They'll eat if they're when they're hungry, they'll eat anything. You know, there's if there's something good and nutritious and full of energy there, they'll chow down on it. Uh, insects, seeds, larvae, whatever. You know, rotting. Or organic matter, you know, some may prefer weed seeds more. Their populations respond are, are very variable. The time of year, the weed seed density, and the predators, what eats them, right? Whatever eats them. So if you have more ground cover, typically they do better because they are, it's safer for them to go out and a bird isn't going to come down and eat them. Uh, and also their activity changes with day-night cycle as well. It's really cool. You know, bugs are really cool. And crabs are really cool. It's like, here's just some of the crab and weed species around. You know, there's more. Did you know there's more of the animals in the world? There are more species of beetles than any animal in the entire world. Uh, I know, uh, I kind of trying to remember his name. Uh, but there was a fa famous na uh, 19th century naturalist that said that God must have been extremely fond of beetles, you know, that, because there are so many different species in the world. Um, if, do I have a couple minutes? 
couple minutes. I just want to fast forward. Oh, there, oh here's my lab. I just want to show them. They're, they're, they're the guys that do all the work. Dilshan, this is Dilshan here. He's going to be the, the person that's actually doing this work. I'm just the, 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 the spokes model of the organization. <laughs> I, just want to, I just wanted to talk a little bit about Dilshan's masters, where we looked at oats and we wanted to see how good modifying agronomy was as a weed control tactic. And this is going from an oat, where we looked at seeding rate, cultivar variety choice, row width, and in-crop harrowing. What we found is that grain yield, and going to a higher density, increased the yield 11%. Harrowing increased the yield 13%. Uh, crop genotype uh, reduced the more competitive genotype uh, had higher oat biomass. Uh, crop density, we'll skip that one. Harrowing worked really well for weed control when there were weeds there. When there weren't weeds there, harrowing didn't do anything. Kind of makes obvious sense, right? Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, so we figured that out. <laughs> uh, weed biomass, a more competitive variety reduced weed biomass by 22%. This is using a forage variety, a very, you couldn't even sell it for seed, but we're using it as a model genotype. Weed density, by having seeding at a double the recommended seed rate, reduced our weed density by 52%. The great thing is when you start putting this stuff together, by our, in terms of grain yield, by using in-crop harrowing in a high crop density, we increased our yield 25%. And this is over regular agronomy. I'm not talking over doing a bad job of growing the oats. This is how a normal producer would grow the oats. So this is by using like supercharged agronomy, really good crop management, you can increase your yield 25%. This is done under organic conditions, good, good organic weeds, you know, uh, wheat biomass, by well, using a competitive cultivar at high crop density, we reduced our wheat biomass 62%. Heroin, adding heroin at high crop density, 65%. When we added a competitive cultivar, high crop density, and heroin, we reduced our wheat biomass 71%. This is almost in the realm of herbicide weed control. I know I shouldn't say that evil word, but for, for a herbicide to consider giving control, it needs to have 80% control. So we're, you know, getting up there. We're, you know, this, this is this is over four site years, you know, real, real data. So we're pretty excited about this stuff too. So uh, that's a little snapshot of what I'm going to do and what I have done, and that's it.